All right, I hope you guys brought your thinking caps today because this is fairly, we're going to get fairly theological today. There are going to be a, num a lot of names, a number of concepts, some, some new theological terms, and I'll try to walk you through that. But um, even if you don't get all of this, even if you only get a portion of it, it will be advantageous because the doctrine of the Trinity has been called the most foundational doctrine of the Christian faith. It is related to Christology, which we talked about last week, and we'll get into that. In fact, I'm going to be um, restating some of the principles we talked about in Christology last week. The fundamental issue of what it means to be a Christian is what do you believe about Jesus Christ? Well, there is the nature and person of Jesus specifically, which is Christology, we talked about last week. But a most, a most critical part of that is how is it that Jesus is divine? In other words, how does he fit into the Trinity? So that's what we're going to be unwrapping today. The class outline, uh, again, this is for the whole class, is uh, last week we looked at Christology and Incarnation, this week Trinity, and by that we are looking still at the nature of Christ, but we're adding our understanding and doctrines of the Father and of the Holy Spirit into our conception of Trinity, three and one. We do not meet next week. But when we come back uh, the following week, we will be talking about ecclesiology, which is the doctrine of the church, then Christian anthropology, what, what it means to be human before God, soteriology, salvation, we're actually going to look at homarchiology, which is the doctrine of sin, and soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, then eschatology, the doctrine of last things, and then conclusion and vital exam. Okay? Questions about any of that? All right, I want to give you, and I haven't done this before, but I want to give you an outline for where we're going today because, as I say, this there's so many aspects to this that are so big, it's very hard to organize it in a way that you just progress through it without kind of doubling back a number of times. Um, and I've worked very hard at trying to figure out how we can make it even flow. But you will hear me repeating some things today because it's necessary to keep things in context as we go through some, what, as I described, some fairly complicated concepts. Um, within the doctrine of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we're going to start out talking about a basic doctrine of God, the belief in one God, about the attributes and nature of God, about then what our belief is about God the Father, about God the Son, which we'll be restating some of the things we talked about last week, and then God the Holy Spirit. Having looked at those kind of individually, and we'll be dropping some Trinitarian comments in as we go along there, we then will look at the Trinity, the three in one, the history of the doctrine of the Trinity, um, the foundation for the doctrine, where do we get this concept, because the word Trinity appears nowhere in the Bible. So how did we come to get this? Then we're going to talk about the relations that, that exist within the Trinity. What is the nature of the relationship between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? We're going to look at a few key concepts, like the word Godhead, which has nothing to do with head. All right, the original word, Old English word, was closer to Godhood, like personhood. But going from Old English to Modern English, it ended up being becoming Godhead instead of Godhood. And we'll talk about that. Maybe I already have. Um, then we'll talk about <laughs> what it means about nature, and then about person or substance, and then we'll talk about some of the mystery of the Trinity, the fact that this isn't an easy one, and what is it we believe about the mystery of the Trinity, and then some disagreements regarding Trinitarianism, that is the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, there are, there are non-Trinitarian uh, beliefs, um, including within groups that call themselves Christian. And then we'll talk about some of the historic heresies and controversies, which again we touched on a little bit last week, and we will uh, unwrap some of those. Because sometimes the way to anchor your understanding of what it is we believe is to understand what it is we don't believe. Because it gives you a, um, a perspective. You have something that, uh, that is uh, relevant to your belief in the, in the contrary. And how it is that those things have been addressed by the church. Okay? Any questions about any of that? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Your. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are talking about God, and in Christianity, of course, God is perceived as the eternal being that created and preserves the entire world. Now, the most fundamental issue we want to start with is that Christianity emerged out of Judaism as a monotheistic religion. 
God is one with the Godhead, and remember that sort of means Godhood. The Godhead is another word for the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit joined together as one. Um, the Godhead is a single being. God is one. This is to, to this day, this is one of the difficulties that the Jewish faith has with Christianity, is they say we believe in three gods. We do not. Christianity came out of Judaism as a monotheistic or one God religion. Now, there's several bases for that, that monotheistic belief. In the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, what is called the Shema, Shema Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And of course, it goes on to say, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus is quoting this later on. We also have the first commandment of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. It's interesting, if you were in our Old Testament class last year, I believe that that and other places in the Old Testament suggest that, that the ancient Jews were not so much monotheistic as they were henotheistic. What that means is henotheistic means that you worship one God, but you believe that there are probably other gods available, even though you selected one. The fact that he said, you'll have no other gods before me, and then he goes on to, uh, you know, with the second commandment as well, that uh, you'll have no graven images with regard to gods, suggests that, and there's other places where we have, um, when Jacob flees and one of his wives takes the household gods of his father-in-law, sorry, what? Rachel. Rachel, his, his wife Rachel, takes the household gods and hides them. She's having her period, so she puts them under the saddle and sits on them and says, I can't get up, I'm having my period. And they couldn't touch her because that would make them unclean. But that very clearly, in parts of the Old Testament, there were multiple gods that even the Jews acknowledged early on. And so in giving of the law, God said to them, you will have no other of those gods before me. I believe that Scripture tells us clearly there are spiritual forces in the world, angels and demons, and that those were the beings that others perceived as being gods. They're not gods, but they are spiritual beings. But that's why I believe that the ancient Hebrews, not just me, but... Uh, Scholars believe that the ancient Hebrews were probably henotheistic rather than monotheistic. But this clearly says there's only one true God. You are to worship one God. Then we have from Isaiah, Thus saith the Lord, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. The prophet Isaiah and other prophets declare clearly that God is to be the only true God. Jumping to the New Testament, we have Jesus in Mark saying, The Lord our God is one. And again, he quotes that as from Deuteronomy, but Jesus himself affirmed that. And then we have the writings of Paul. In 1 Corinthians 8, for instance, Paul writes, To us there is one God, the Father, of whom um, are all things, and we unto him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and we through him. There is one God, and yet, at the same time, Paul identifies Jesus as Lord, Kyrios in the Greek, which is a sign of dominion, of power. He calls him the Christ, which identifies him as the Messiah, the anointed one of God that was expected, and says that through him all things were made, which is consistent with John 1. So while it almost seems in one breath that Paul is saying there is only one God, but there is also deity or divinity in Jesus. We'll talk about that a little bit as we go along. But the point in all of these passages is that we believe that Christian faith coming out of Judaism, we, we hold there is one true God, the creator God who made the universe and maintains the universe. Okay? Now, um, in the Trinitarian view, I'm going to have to drop sort of Trinitarian ideas in here as we go along in, for, in order for it to make sense. We do come to the place where we believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but... We maintain those are one God because we say that those three persons, and we'll talk about that term later, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are identified as persons, that they still are of one essence, of one substance, of one being. In fact, the most central and crucial affirmation of our Christian faith is that there is one God, and there is one salvation, which is manifested in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the only way we can access that salvation is by the Holy Spirit. So, central to the Christian faith is that there is one God, but three persons who have respective responsibilities within our relationship to God. It's important to note, too, the God of the Old Testament is exactly the same as the God of the New Testament. And that's not just a Jewish problem. Some uh, ultra-conservative Christians 
have suggested down through the centuries that the God of the Old Testament might actually be different than the God of the New Testament. We believe there is one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is the God who is the Father of Jesus Christ, and of us all. Okay? <laughs> Come in. Um, and that goes against what many people have maintained is that Christianity has, is polytheistic, meaning multiple gods. Judaism has accused Christianity of that for the last 2,000 years. Islam accuses us of that. Uh, the Muslim faith uh, has what's called the Tawid. The Tawid is the doctrine of the oneness of God. Um, and that is the fundamental, that is the platform, the foundation on which Islam is built. The, to become Muslim, you're required to say the single confession, and that is there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. If you declare that and mean it, you're a Muslim, as far as they're concerned. Because that Tawid, that declaration of God is only one God, is the foundation. That is what Islam is, as far as they're concerned. Okay. Now I want to talk a little bit about some of the attributes and nature of God. I don't think I need to go on to the next slide yet. Um, the theology of the attributes and nature of God, and attributes simply means the qualities or the characteristics. So what is God like, is what we're saying here, um, has been developing in terms of a New Testament conception of that since quite early on. There began to be developed uh, in the apostolic, immediately post-apostolic period, a um, clear sense of what the nature of God was now that they had the revelation of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. In the second century, one of the early church fathers, Irenaeus, addressed the issue fairly specifically in his book called Against Heresies, and he stated, among other things, that God's greatness lacks nothing but contains all things. And he then went on to identify some of the specific attributes that God has as part of his greatness. He identified three sources for these attributes of God. One is scripture. For instance, it talks about God being in heaven and things of that sort, about the power of God. He also then looked at prevailing mysticism and popular piety, that is, people's experience of God. Um, as time passed, theologians and philosophers began to develop more precise understandings and therefore more precise lists of the attributes of God. They got more systematic about it. Now, traditionally, as they began to develop those, uh, those attributes of God from the second century on, they fell generally into two groups. Some of the attributes of God, or characteristics of God, were considered attributes of negation, which means the things that God was not, or the things that could not affect God. For instance, that God is impassable, you know, he, or immutable, that he cannot change, that he cannot be affected. That would be an example of an attribute of negation, something that can't affect God. Then the second category that they developed was, were called uh, attributes of eminence, with an E, E-M-I-N-E-N-C-E. -E. Eminence means like, you know, you meet a bishop, your eminence, or he was an eminent authority. <coughs> it means the aspects of God's um, character that are demonstrations of his power or of his greatness. That God is, for instance, infinitely good. That God is all-knowing. Those are the kinds of attributes or characteristics of God which are identified as attributes of eminence. We come down now to the 8th century, and a church leader called John of Damascus identified 18 specific attributes. And those 18 attributes continue to be recognized right up until today. Um, the, he divided, John of Damascus in the 8th century, divided the attributes of God into four groups. They were the attributes of time, like the fact that God is everlasting. Attributes of space, the fact that God is uh, boundless, he is not limited. Attributes of matter, um, and attributes of quality, you know, what, what is God like? More time passed, theologians become more and more systematic about these attributes, um, mostly based upon the Bible, but sometimes based upon theological reasoning. And Trinity, as we'll talk about here, Trinity itself is based upon not script, a specific scriptural word that's found, but rather upon theological uh, reasoning based upon the, the whole of scripture. By the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas, the, one of the great saints of the Catholic Church, focused on a shorter list than John of Damascus, but very similar to it. He identified eight primary attributes of God. They were simplicity, 
which is interesting. We don't usually think of that. But God is simplicity. Perfection, goodness, incomprehensibility, omnipresence, that he is everywhere, immutability, that he cannot be changed, eternity, and oneness. The oneness really is a reference to the trinity of God. Other formulations after Thomas Aquinas occurred in 1251, the Fourth Lateran Council um, adopted Aquinas' ideas, and they passed down to uh, the, the Vatican I, uh, officially acknowledged those in 1870, and then our own, that is Presbyterian's own, Westminster Shorter Catechism, which was uh, uh, written in the 17th century, took the work that Thomas Aquinas and that the Catholic Church had done and accepted those as the attributes of God. Now, um, I'm almost done with the attributes part. You know, some of this I know seems dry, but this is part of our theological understanding. Carolyn? Can you repeat the eight? Eight. The eight were simplicity, perfection, goodness, incomprehensibility. God is not like us. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. Omnipresence, immutability, eternity, and oneness. Right. Word? How did they get simplicity? Well, the fact that God, um, God isn't as confused as we are. <laughs> okay, that there, there is a, there is a um, clarity of focus and intent and purity about God that is not intermingled with other stuff. God is love, and in that He is pure love, and there is a simplicity in that. Whereas my love is all messed up with all kinds of selfishness and darkness and everything else. So I am much more complex in that way that God is. God is much more direct. The attribute, every attribute of God is a pure attribute, is one way to say that. Yeah, I can see the other ones, but simplicity blows me away. Yeah. Yeah. It is an unusual one. That's, uh, Why can't I understand it? It's so simple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, God is so simple, he is very hard to understand. Now, two attributes that I don't specifically list in, in the Aquinas' list, but that have been critical in understanding God, and we talk about these in our new members class, for instance, are transcendence and eminence. Transcendence means that God is not like us. You know, so this comes in, in, in with regard to incomprehensibility and uh, immutability, etc. God transcendence means that God is eternal, He is infinite, He is beyond any control from the created world or from human events. So He is other than us and above us and different from us. But on the other hand, there is the doctrine of eminence, or the characteristic or attribute of eminence, which says that God has chosen to be involved in this world. That he um, has expressed his intentions for human affairs and been available to us in that. So on the one hand, God is transcendent, wholly other and apart, but he has chosen to be eminent. That is immediately present to us. Those two things, transcendence and eminence, sort of bracket the scale of God's character in terms of our understanding of it. Now, an important point here is that when we talk about God being eminent, that is not the same as saying God is uh, of, of one substance with his created universe. That's pantheism. You know the word pantheism? It's one of the sort of philosophical underpinnings of a lot of um, ancient Eastern religions and New Age religions. The idea that that God is the rocks and the trees and the hills and the chairs and the people, that all those things together make up God. No, God is not made up of anything that is in the created universe. He is above that. Pantheism says that God is the sum total of all, of, all the physical world, all the created universe. That is not what Christianity believes. Okay, so it's important to note that. Other theologians, Louis uh, Burkhoff, who is a Reformed theologian, one of our kin, um, identified, and I think this is helpful, uh, particularly if you're preparing sermons, that some of the characteristics of God are communicable attributes, and some are incommunicable attributes. What that means is, there are some characters of God that we can take on. You know, God is love. We can be more, we can be loving. You know, we can, we can exercise some of the things of God, you know, um, but there are other attributes of God. Those are the communicable ones that God can communicate to us. We can, we can express wisdom in our lives. Uh, some of the things that are inherent in the nature of God. We can be creative. One of the characteristics of God is He is a creative God. Just look. Okay. Then the incommunicable ones are the ones that we cannot share with God or cannot be passed on to us, like 
Omniscience, I can't know everything. Omnipresence, I can't be everywhere at once. Um, uh, so there are aspects of God that we can take on and should because we desire to become more like God and others that we cannot. Right. There, is a, there is kind of a way to have the attributes of God and that's through the Holy Spirit, isn't mm -hmm. it? I mean, well, like we may be praying for, Lord, lead me to the right job, or lead me to, we don't see the future. I mean, so in that sense, we're beyond ourselves. Right. Well, exactly that. Any of the communicable attributes are given to us by the grace of Christ and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. That's why the Holy Spirit is described as being a teacher and comforter and encourager. It is the Holy Spirit that makes any of those things possible in us in terms of the attributes of God. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the Holy Spirit is very much involved in that. Okay, um, let's talk now about God the Father, the specific uh, first person of the Trinity. In the emergence of the Trinitarian theology of God the Father in early Christianity, there really were two key issues that they struggled with to try to figure out answers to. These are similar to the issues we talked about in Christology and that we'll come to when we talk about God the Son. The first of those two key ideas is the way in which the Yahweh of the Old Testament and the God of Jesus in the New Testament are the same. I say that that was a key issue for them because uh, a very superficial understanding of it makes it look like, and people will say this, the God of the Old Testament was a righteous, judgmental, justice-oriented God. And the God of the New Testament is a God of mercy and grace and sacrifice through His Son, etc. Well, you don't have to... People who say that, although that's a common idea, haven't really paid attention to the Old Testament. The number of times that God in the Old Testament, despite the lack of worth or worthiness of the Israelites, still took them back and loved them and blessed them. And then they would defy him to his face and betray his love. They would be judged righteously, and then later God would take them back again, over and over and over again. And yet, one of the struggles is that the theology of the, the Trinitarian theology of God the Father was how, in what way, is God of the Old Testament and God of the New Testament the same? We've had whole theologies built up around trying to describe the differences between how God acted in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Dispensationalism is um, one of those theological structures which say God has acted differently uh, at different times, different dispensations. That's what that word means, is an era of time. Um, I don't believe that's act true. That's not Reformed theology. We don't believe God has changed, nor has God changed his plans. God has unfolded himself to us in a, in a progressive kind of way as we have grown in our, you know, as humanity, but he hasn't changed. It's not like God got to the end of the Old Testament and went, well darn, that's not working. I'm going to have to try something different. Okay? And dispensationalism has always felt to me like that's exactly what it's saying. That God got to a certain place and said, that plan isn't working. I'm going to have to completely change gears. That is not what we believe. But we do have to work on understanding how the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are the same. And then the second key issue that had to be dealt with in terms of the doctrine of God the Father is the way in which God the Father is distinct, and yet there is unity between God the Father and Jesus His Son and the Holy Spirit. So those issues. How is the Old Testament Yahweh and the New Testament God the same, the God of Jesus? And how does God the Father in his distinctness, still have union with Jesus and uh, Jesus the Son and with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> we have such wonderful music in here. It's just, um, an example of the unity of the Son and Father are found in some of these verses. Um, from John 14, 20, Jesus said, I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. This idea of the unity uh, from John 5.18, he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. Matthew 11, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. John 16.15, all that the Father has is mine. John 17.22, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. That's Jesus talking to the Father in the high priestly prayer. John 10.30, I and the Father are one. Uh, John 10, 38, the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Galatians 1, 1, sent not from men, nor by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. These 
Some of these actually come right out and say, I and the Father are one. Some of them clearly imply, or clearly say, that activities that occurred within God's plan are uh, events driven by both God the Father and Jesus the Son. And so that's where we get the questions about the nature of the unity between Jesus and God the Father. Now, this concept of fatherhood of God appears in the Old Testament very slightly, but it really is not a major theme in the Old Testament. The idea of God the Father really develops in the New Testament because of Jesus, that Jesus identified God the Father. He even spoke of God as Abba, which is a diminutive. It literally means Daddy. They had not conceived of thinking of God that way in the Jewish history because of the Old Testament. But Jesus' emphasis on his special relationship with the Father, um, and yet the distinctness of the nature of Jesus from the nature of God the Father, is part of what leads us into the direction of the Trinity, of trying to understand that. This paternal view of God as Father extended then beyond Jesus to the disciples. Because you remember, Jesus said to the disciples, when you pray, pray like this, our Father. That was not part of the Jewish prayers prior to that. The, the introduction of the Lord's Prayer as a prayer to our Father, which is now called the Our Father, especially in the Catholic circles, um, was a very different kind of idea. And from the apostles to the disciples and then to the entire church, the idea of God as Father developed from that point. So that was one aspect in which Jesus identified the fatherhood of God and passed that on to us. Now, in the Trinitarian theology, God the Father is identified as the principium, which means the beginning, or the source, or the origin of both the Son and the Holy Spirit. That does not mean we believe that the Son and Holy Spirit were created by God the Father. They are co-eternal. And yet, Scripture identifies that God the Father is the source, the etern eternal source of all the Godhead which means all three persons of the Trinity. The Father is the one who eternally begets the Son, His only begotten Son, John 3.16 says. And the Father eternally breathes the Holy Spirit. The Son is eternally born from the Father, and the Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father. Now we're going to talk about that as we go along. That's, that's where we get into some of the mystery of the relationship between on the one hand, we have passages that say very clearly to us about the Father begetting the Son and breathing the Holy Spirit, and yet they are co-eternal with the Father. That's why one of, the past, one of the sections of our talk today is going to be on the mystery of the Trinity. But notwithstanding the difference as to that relationship, God the Father is one with, is co-equal with, co-eternal with, and consubstantial with, the Son and the Holy Spirit, each one of the persons of the Trinity, are one eternal God and no way separated. All alike are uncreated and omnipotent. And so the divine unity of the Trinity consists of God the Father with His Son and His Spirit distinct from God the Father and yet perfectly united in Him. Let me run ahead to a picture I have here. This is one of the graphic images that they have used for uh, the Trinity before. You'll notice central is the concept of God. God the Father in the upper left corner is God. God the Son in the upper right corner is God. The Holy Spirit at the bottom is God. But the Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. Okay? This is the mystery of the concept of the Trinity. All are God. All are individual persons and yet they share one nature. A good way to think about that person the nature thing is nature is what you, um, is, is your substance. Nature is what you're made of. Personhood is who you are. So it's the difference in what you are versus who you are. God, the trinity of God, is one substance, one nature. That is what God is. But within that, there are three who's. There are three persons that have personality. They can speak in the first person, I. This is part of the mystery, okay? Let me go back. Again, part of the challenge here, well, I'll get, I'm getting it now to God the Son. Let's talk about God the Son. I'm going to be restating some things we talked about last week, briefly. 
Since the start of Christianity, Jesus has been uh, given a number of different titles. He was called Messiah, which is the Mashiach, the Hebrew concept of the anointed one that God is going to send. It is the Hebrew version of the word Christ. Same word, Hebrew, Greek, Messiah, Christ. And he's been called the Son of God, most clearly in John, but elsewhere as well. Now, it's important to notice that Messiah and Son of God are not interchangeable in terms of their meaning. Messiah is a clear reference to the fact that Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament Jewish expectation for the one God would send. Son of God refers to a paternal relationship with God the Father. The Jews, for instance, did not, did not expect, and that's one of the reasons they had trouble accepting Jesus, they did not expect the Messiah to be divine. They thought he was going to be a person like King David. They thought Elijah might come back and he might be the, the Messiah, or that King David would be sort of reincarnated, or that one of David's line would come back. They did not realize that he was truly going to be the Son of God, the one who is in a father-son relationship with God the Father. In terms of his divinity, according to the Gospels, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Um, he... Where do I want to go with that? <laughs> um, I'm trying to figure out how much of this I need to do in order to, to not confuse you. Uh, the narrative of the Gospels, in addition to the incarnation by the Holy Spirit in the Virgin Mary, emphasizes miraculous powers and very other, various other ways in which Jesus manifested power, which would have been attributed to, to God and not to anything that human beings could do. That is why it is following some of his miraculous events that Jesus often received testimonies of being the divine Son of God. Um, we also have the, the most important of all, one third of all the gospel passages have to do with the last seven days of Jesus' life and his death and resurrection, one third. Because that aspect, the passion of Jesus, his death on our behalf, his resurrection, was so that we sinful humans could be reconciled back to God and therefore that is the means by which we are offered salvation and eternal life. So one third of the Gospels focus on that, and that whole focus is very clearly based upon the divinity of Jesus. The fact that it was only by being truly God that he could take upon himself the sins of the world and uh, atone for them. Okay. Now that belief in the redemptive nature of Jesus' death goes back even before the first letters of the New Testament, before the Pauline letters to the very earliest days of Christianity and the, the Christian church. And we need to recognize that then those things started being written down in the, the survey class. We've talked about the fact that there was a period of oral history, which most Westerners think, well, if they hadn't written it down, then they must have messed it up. They would have gotten it wrong and got the stories mixed up and, and put, wrong, you know, put false stories in there and everything else. That's not the case. Oral history in that part of the world, in that time in history, was probably as reliable or more reliable than us writing something down. And so the oral history was critical. Throughout all of that, oral history and then the beginning of the writing of the New Testament documents all the way up into the, the time of the Nicene Creed, which nailed down the doctrine of the Trinity, there really continue to be two Christological concerns. And they're very closely related to the two concerns we had about God the Father. And that is first, how could Jesus be truly God and yet there be one God? That idea of how could God the Father be united with Jesus and yet we only had one God. It's the other half of that equation. And then secondly, how could the human and the divine both be combined in one person? The nature of Jesus. We talked about that quite a bit last week. So this theology of God the Son developed over 300 years or so and then eventually was articulated in the Nicene Creed which came to us in the, first, the end of the first quarter of the 4th century, 325 or so. Later on, the, Cal the Creed of uh, Chalcedon in 451 expanded on it and clarified it even more in terms of Jesus being God incarnate, true God and true man, fully divine and fully human. That is, that Jesus was not 80-20 or 50-50. He was 100% human in all respects and suffered all the pains and temptations that we have. And yet, he was fully God, that he, as divine, he defeated death and rose again. Yes, Gil. What happened with Jesus Christ when he's a man, he's not omnipresent. He knows part of the right. He not he not he don't know what what happened in the future because they don't know when he come back. Right. Uh, Philippians two 
is the explanation for that. In Philippians 2, what's called the kenosis passage, it says that you should be like Christ, who, uh, it's talking about humility, who did not count, who himself being God, did not count his divinity as something to be grasped, but rather set it aside. That's the kenosis, but rather set it aside so that he could be fully like us. So Jesus did not stop being divine, but he chose not to uh, maintain or hold on to all of his divine powers so that he could fully relate to us and be human in a way that we can relate to. Uh, the best analogy I could have is, is for me to walk along, I can I have full sight, but if I choose not to look over there, okay. it's not because I've lost my powers, it's because I choose not to use all of my power for something. Okay? They don't um, use it. They don't use it. Right. He, he set it aside. Kenosis. From Philippians 2. Um, if I, you know, if I'm going to wrestle with one of my dogs, I'm not going to use my full strength if I'm playing with it because I might hurt him. Okay, and so I set aside some of my power. Those are bad analogies, but they're the best we can understand. That kenosis passage that Jesus set aside part of His power for our sakes. And the power from the Spirit Santo, the Holy Spirit, come when He is baptized. In the baptism. Uh, no, Jesus had the Holy Spirit the whole time. Again, he did not lose his power, he chose not to use it. And, I, and the way we know that is because when he did choose to use it, he healed the lame, gave sight to the blind, he raised the dead, he walked on water, he stilled the storm, he turned water into wine. Whenever Jesus chose to use his power as a demonstration for a positive for our sake, he had full access to it. He had not lost it, it had not been taken away from him, he chose not to use it. For, for the most part. But then, um, an example, and you used one, he, the idea that he didn't know the future. He says, you know, no one knows the, the day in which um, the consummation will come. Not even I, only the Father in heaven. Well, that's because he chose that. Right? And the power okay. of the Spirit of and the power of the Holy Spirit was always present with him. Always. Always. But in, in Mark 4, they say after the temptations, they say the Holy Spirit come with right. power. Right. Well, I think that uh, there's a couple places where, you know, like there's one place where the voice from heaven comes, and it says it was for the benefit of those around. Uh -huh. I believe the visible descending of the Holy Spirit on him was just a visible demonstration of the pleasure of God the <clears throat> Father for the sake of those that were present. And it was visible because it got recorded for us. Um, but it's not as though Jesus was lacking something at that point, because the danger is if we go there, then we fall into the, at least we have, we're in danger of falling into the doctrine of adoptionism, or the, the, the belief of adoptionism. That is that Jesus in some way was not wholly divine, or not complete, until his baptism when the Holy Spirit came on. Came on. The, the most literal adoptionist heresy is that Jesus was not even divine, he was just human, until the baptism, the Holy Spirit came on, on him, and God the Father made him divine. That's not what we believe. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit, and from the very moment of conception, he, and when he went, took on human flesh, he still was divine from that instant. He had been for all eternity with the Father. Okay. Um, here are a number of different reflections on the divinity of Jesus. Colossians 1.16, For by him all things were created, talking about Jesus, Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. This is talking about Jesus. Colossians 1.16, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Not 60-40 human divine. All of the deity lives in him. John 1, 1, and then verse 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and then without Him was not anything made that was made. It says, through Him all things were made. With, and without Him was not anything made that was made. He was the creative force that God used in making the universe. John 20, Thomas' confession to Him, My Lord and my God. And the interesting thing is that quite a few of the professions of the divinity of Jesus in the New Testament are somebody else saying things like, my Lord and my God, you are, surely this was the Son of God, you know, you, you say that you are the Son of God. Jesus never corrects people when they say that, ever. Which is critically important. 
And then truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And there's a couple meanings there, both a time-oriented meaning, but also the I am, which is, of course, the name of God, Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton. God said, I am who I am, when Moses asked him what his name was. And this I am that Jesus used is a direct reference to that. Okay? <coughs> We looked at this last week. We have other passages where Jesus was God incarnate, where he miraculously was born of a virgin, where he was the divine creator, where he is the Lord. One of the reasons I put this on here is that when you go back and pull up the PowerPoint notes and stuff, you've got all of this stuff in front of you, okay? Um, back up. I want to do the Holy Spirit first. Now, again, God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. In the Pauline epistles, we have... A number of references to the Holy Spirit, like 1 Thessalonians 4, 8, God who gives his Holy Spirit unto us, from John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, so that there's so many passages that you can almost say that the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, which is called pneumatology, like, like pneumonia, in the breath, pneumatology is the theology of the Holy Spirit, that... Um, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit in Paul's writings is almost as powerful as his doctrine of Jesus Christ, his, his Christology. Now, he doesn't say it's the Spirit you get saved by, but the Holy Spirit is so much a part of, of Paul's explanation of God. In mainstream Christianity, of course, the Holy Spirit has, has always been perceived uh, as one of the three divine persons of the Holy Trinity. Now, how he fits in there has sometimes been a matter of, of uh, discussion or, or controversy. But the orthodox belief is that he, the Holy Spirit is of single substance with God the Father and God the Son, that he is acting in concert with and shares the essential nature of God the Father and God the Son, who is Jesus. So it's God the Holy Spirit, we'll talk about in a few minutes, is not less than. Okay? Of course, the Holy Spirit is usually referred to as the third person of the triune God, God the Father being the first person, God the Son being the second person, and the Holy Spirit being the third person. Holy, divine in nature, completely self-aware and self-expressive, he is a personality. Sometimes I think the Holy Spirit gets gathered a bad rap because we don't know his name. You know, God the Father, you know, we refer to as Yahweh, that is really the name of the whole Godhead. Jesus, we have a name for the Holy Spirit, we don't have a name. And so I think sometimes people miss out on the fact that he is a first person. That the Holy Spirit is personal and relates to us. The Holy Spirit is affirmed as being sacred, as, the, as being sacred in the nature of God, in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, because in all three places they say that the one unforgivable sin is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. If he were not fully God, if he were not sacred in that regard, then blasphemy would not be something that would be a problem with him, with regard to him. Because blasphemy is a denial of God. Um, of course, Jesus, one of the strongest affirmations of the Trinity, um, uh, I'll wait that. is in the end of Matthew, the Great Commission, when Jesus says, go and make disciples of all people uh, in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world, and baptize them, how? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now... <laughs> I don't want to overplay this, I think some people have, but I do think there's some consequence to the fact that Jesus didn't say, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Nor did he say, baptize them in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. The first way would suggest that they really were only one. One person. The third way would suggest that there was really a separation between the three, that they perhaps weren't of the same essence. What he said was, Baptize it in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Which gives us that, you know, one essence, one nature, but three persons um, in that great commission. Okay? The Holy Spirit is seen to have a number of very specific kinds of responsibility. Now, the Nicene Creed refers to the Holy Spirit as the Lord and giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son and his worship and glorified. It does not say a whole lot more about the Holy Spirit. But based upon Scripture, we understand that the Holy Spirit of God, since Acts 2, the start of the Christian church, indwells the lives and hearts of all believers in Jesus Christ, of all the faithful. The Holy Spirit has specific responsibilities, we're told. Every new believer is born again of the Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit enables Christian life by indwelling individual believers, leading them into a righteous life. The Holy Spirit acts as comforter. Also, the, the, the word for that is paraclete. You ever see paraclete? That means comforter, one who comforts us in our times of need. He is also the one who convinces unredeemed people of their sinfulness and of their moral standing as sinners before God, so he convicts us of our sins. The Holy Spirit also is the inspiration and interpreter of Scripture. He inspired those who wrote the Bible, and he uh, inspires the correct interpretation of the Scripture for those of us who read it. After the Arian controversy, you remember that the Arian controversy is what led to the Nicene Council in the 300s because Arian questioned the eternal nature of Jesus. That whole thing was over what was the nature of Jesus. Well, it didn't actually die down immediately. It continued, and 100 years later, they had another council to really kind of nail down the Trinity aspect. But after that whole Arian controversy over the nature and eternity of Jesus dwindled down, the debate moved from the deity of Jesus to the nature of the Holy Spirit and his equality with the Father and the Son. There was a whole sect called the Pneumatokamai, um, who were the Pneuma, the Spirit, that declared that the Holy Spirit, it's funny that they would use that as their name, because their whole declaration was that the Holy Spirit was inferior to the Father and the Son, that he was a lesser being, in the same way that Arius had suggested that Jesus was a lesser being. But con countering the uh, Pneumatokamai, the Cappadocian fathers, the, some of the, the uh, post-Nicene fathers, argued for the equality of the Holy Spirit with the Father and the Son, they, for instance, used the baptism, the, uh, baptism instructions of the Great Commission from Matthew 28 to declare the equality, baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There's no diminishing of authority in that. They also would use passages, Basil the Great was one of the Cappadocian fathers. He takes Psalm 33, even, and says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. I've talked about pneuma, which is the, the Greek word, uh, but the Hebrew word for breath and for spirit both is ruach. And so Basil the Great said, or Basil the Great said that when Psalm 33 says, by the word of the Lord, that's Jesus, because we're told, you know, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, that's Jesus, and by the breath of his mouth, the Ruach, all their host. Basil said that the Holy Spirit, while creation was done by the Son, it was with the participation of the Holy Spirit. You'll remember from Genesis 1, it says, in the, uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and his Spirit was hovering over the water. That's the first appearance of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit occurs all through the Old Testament. And then it says, and God said, which means he spoke the word. And that connects to the idea that through the word all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. Yes? I read that uh, C.S. Lewis referred to numinous. Uh, That's actually a different word. That make me do some research. Yeah. Interesting. Numinous is not the same root as the word pneuma, the Greek word pneuma. Numinous means, um, I mean, you think it might have something to do with it, but it has to do with ethereal or uh, mysterious. Uh, spiritually greater than us, this sense of awe that we have. In fact, Lewis uh, had a, an experience with what he called joy. His biography, his early biography, is called Surprised by Joy, which they thought was funny because after he wrote that book, he then went, met Joy David and got married late in life. But um, this idea of joy, this sense of a numinous um, awesomeness in the universe. Went to the mountain passages. Exactly. Carolyn, could you? Well, it, it occurs to me that you can't speak a word without breath. So it's... The so relationship. So the relationship is yeah. there. Um, Good, I like that. I never thought that was <laughs> Good. Good. All right. So, um, one last section on the sort of biblical references and things. References to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, Trinity references. First from Matthew 3, this actually occurs in all four of the Gospels, this, this event, which is the baptism event. As soon as Jesus Christ was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and landing on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. 
the presence of the three persons of the Trinity are there. Jesus the Son, the descending of the Holy Spirit, and the voice of God from heaven saying, This is my Son, and whom I'm well pleased. God the Father. Okay? And then from Luke, the Annunciation to Mary, the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the Most High, which is a reference to God the Father, will overshadow you, and for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. All three of the persons of the Trinity were involved in the Annunciation, the announcement to Mary of her uh, having been chosen to be the mother of Jesus. Then from Hebrews 9, we have, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? Again, references to the multiple persons of the Trinity. Acts 7, But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. By the full of the Holy Spirit, he sees God the Father and Jesus in heaven. And Matthew 28, we've already referred to, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Those references all identify the persons of the Trinity as distinct entities, distinct persons, and yet together as God. And so that really is the foundational kind of aspect that leads us to the doctrine of the Trinity. This chart will give you, and again, I don't expect you to be able to write all this down, but it, it will be online for you when we get it uploaded. It gives you some idea of the characteristics and nature of God that various scriptures uh, affirm as being part of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are all three called God. They're all three identified as creator or part of creation. They all three talk about uh, an involved <coughs> resurrection, of being of indwelling, of being everywhere, of being all-knowing, of sanctifying, of being givers of life, of providing fellowship uh, with one another and us, of being eternal, of having a will, of speaking, of loving, of searching the heart. And then, as a, for the Father and the Son, we have the, the clear scriptures that say we belong to them both, they are, Jesus is our Savior by the power of God the Father. We serve them both. We believe in them both. They both give us joy, and they both will be involved in judgment. So this gives you a sense, and you can go back and look up all those verses, um, the extent to which the Trinity is clearly referred to throughout the entirety of Scripture. Okay? So that brings us to the Trinity um, and this symbol. Why don't we go ahead and take a break right now? It's, it's a few minutes till two. Let's come back. Uh, take about seven minutes. Let's come back at five after two. Okay. So let's talk now about the Trinity itself. I've hinted at it. I've given you pieces of it. We sort of laid a foundation for it. But let's talk about the doctrine of the Trinity. The word Trinity is a term that is used to denote the Christian doctrine that God exists as a unity of three distinct persons or hypostasis. You'll remember that we talked about the Christology of Jesus being fully God and fully human as being called the hypostatic union. It has to do with personhood. So we believe that God exists as a unity of three distinct persons, or hypostases, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are distinct from each other, yet they are identical in essence, having, excuse me, having a single divine nature. The Father is not the same person as the Son, who is not the same person as the Holy Spirit, who is not the same person as the Father, as we have here in our diagram. Each is divine, and yet there are not three gods, there is still only one God with three persons making up that God. Every one of the three persons of the Trinity, fully divine and independent in regard to the ability to relate. Now, the word person here, I'm going to come and talk about terms in a minute, denotes that individuality and self-awareness. Each of the three persons of the, of the Trinity have a, their own will, they have the ability to love, to communicate, they can speak in the first person, to people in the second person, the I-you kind of relationship. Now, and yet, the thing we always have to keep coming back to is that within this doctrine of the Trinity, there is a strict and absolute monotheism. It is one God. There exists in the universe only one true God, who is the creator God, who is self-existent and unchangeable. And that's the part of the Christian faith that Judaism and Islam and so many other religions, even some who would claim to be Christians, don't get. 
The Oxford Dictionary of, Christ of the Christian Church describes the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity, as the central dogma or doctrine of Christian theology. It is the thing on which everything else hangs. Again, for the most part, because inherent in the doctrine of the Trinity is Christology. We did Christology last week, and now we're just expanding it to see how that fits into the fact that our belief in the Trinity is that God is three persons, each of those persons is divine, and yet there is only one God. This belief in Trinity is held by Roman Catholicism, Eastern and Orthodox uh, religions, Protestant uh, denominations, all. Now, again, there are some exceptions who don't hold to that, and there are some variances within that with regard to the aspect of the nature of Christ, particularly in, in some of the Eastern religions. But let's talk about um, some of the history of that doctrine now. How did we, uh, how did this doctrine come to be? Because it's not as easy to say, oh, here's, here is the verse that says Trinity. God is a Trinity. The word Trinity does not explicitly appear in the Bible. And yet, as Trinitarians, we believe that there is so much other biblical teaching related to this that it is the, the only reasonable conclusion based upon the rest of Scripture. Now, in early Christianity, the very earliest days before the writing of any of the New Testament, the concept of salvation was closely related to the invocation of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Since the first centuries, first century, Christians have been calling upon God with the name Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in prayer, in baptism, as part of communion, in exorcism of spirits, hymn singing, preaching, confession, absolution, benediction, there has always been, since uh, the, the death of Jesus, a sense in which the doctrine of the Trinity existed simply because Christians have invoked the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as the three persons of God. Now, within the New Testament, we've talked about a number of the passages already um, that, that bring out the Trinity as a liturgical or doxological formula, if you will. For instance, 2 Corinthians 1.21 says, He that establishes us in Christ anointed us and is God, who sealed us and gave us the earnest spirit in our hearts. Again, Christ, anointed by God, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Christ is identified as receiving authority and co-equal divinity, but always God the Father mentioned and the Holy Spirit mentioned. By the end of the first century, from which we do have the attestations of, of prayers and benedictions and things in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit, we have Clement of Rome writing references to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and linking them to the act of creation. We then, around 110, we get Ignatius of Antioch, one of the, um, the pre-Nicene fathers, writing in support of the Trinity, exhorting obedience to Christ and to the Father and to the Spirit. One of the other great fathers of the church, Justin Martyr, who was born around AD 100, the end of the first century, would write later, in the name of God, the Father and Lord of the universe, and of our Savior Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit. In the second century, I've already mentioned Irenaeus, who wrote in his book Against Heresies, the church believes in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and the sea, and all things that are in them, and in one Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who became incarnate for our salvation, and in the Holy Spirit. The reason I'm giving you all of these is to let you know that through from the very earliest days of the Christian faith, after the death of Jesus, we have specific examples, early traditions spoken, and very early on traditions written, about the belief in this Trinity. The first time the word Trinity is used in reference to God is in the late 2nd century, um, a church leader named Theophilus of Antioch, defines the Trinity, and uses that word the first time, through as being God and His Word, the Logos, and His Wisdom, Sophia, which he uses as a symbol for the Holy Spirit. But he talks about it in the context of creation. From that second century onward, Western creeds start including regularly the affirmations of God the Father Almighty, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The most formal presentation of the Trinity in the early years of the church was in the early 3rd century, around AD 213. And um, Tertullian was a Latin father. We had Latin fathers and Greek fathers back in those days. Latin fathers was when the church moved west into the Roman Empire and Latin became the dominant language. 
Well, around 213, Tertullian formulated the first defense of the doctrine of the Trinity against some who were opposing it. His uh, declaration of the Trinity and his defense of it was then later uh, affirmed in the Council, the Ecumenical Council of 381. He was the one, Tertullian is the one, that began to talk about the Trinity in terms of person and substance to explain Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as one in essence and yet three in person. That was Tertullian. So we're talking about early 3rd century. This is over 100 years before the Council of Nicaea kind of nailed down that Trinitarian idea. 325, Castle of Nicaea meets. At the end of that time, they, they announced the official Orthodox doctrine of the Trinity in the Nicene Creed, which describes Christ as being God from God, light from light, very God from very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. And as I said earlier, and they, they mentioned the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. I'm going to talk about that and the Son in a minute. In 381, about uh, six, less than 60 years later, the First Council of Constantinople gets more specific in defining the dogma in its simplest outlines, against, again, in order to try to fight against heresies. St. Augustine, one of the great saints of the church in the 5th century, Augustine's writing always seems so contemporary to us. It's, it's so readable. He wrote the world's first autobiography, uh, his confessions, world's first history's first autobiography. Um, and he wrote the City of God to help the church understand what was going on when Rome fell in the 400s. And yet you read Augustine today, and it's like he could have, been, he could have written this two years ago. It's amazing how, how it is transferred to us. And so much of our theology was either written or affirmed by Augustine. He wrote a theological doctrine, uh, uh, tractate rather, called On the Trinity, which uh, was the major development in the understanding of the Trinity and of the nature of God for three or four hundred years until John of Damascus developed it further. Then, as I said, in the 13th century, you get Thomas Aquinas writing about the, the Trinity, and then that passed on to us in terms of the Orthodox, or right, right faith, right believing of uh, the Trinity. As I said, the Trinity, yes, okay, uh, the word Trinity does not occur in the New Testament, and yet so much of the New Testament talks about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and the nature of those three together. The, the relationship within the Bible of those three persons is critical in our understanding of God at all. The Bible teaches divinity amongst all three of those separate persons, one uh, substance. Now, the doctrine of the Trinity, then, I think we need to understand cannot be referred to one verse. The one most commonly used is Matthew 28, 19, which is, you know, baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. But it really is a combination of all of Scripture, mostly New Testament. Some scholars will claim that part of the Old Testament refers to this. Uh, for instance, we have Isaiah saying, and a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and he will be mighty God, wonderful counselor. Um, so the suggestion that there is divinity to come in the son of the, of the virgin when she gives birth. Yes? This is probably out of context and should have asked it before, but uh, the Jews do believe that God is spirit, though, right? Isn't that in the Old Testament? That's correct. Yeah. Now, um, Mormons don't. Ah. Um, and, and there are, I'll talk later about, there are other groups like Christian scientists and Mormons, etc., that have a very different view of God. And for some reason, I can't tell you why, unless there's something in the Book of Mormon or something I don't know about, the Mormons believe, while the Holy Spirit is spirit, that both God and Jesus, God the Father and Jesus, have a perfected material body. I don't know, does the Father live in Omaha? I, I, <laughs> well, Michelangelo painted him. Michelangelo painted him. Maybe that was it. So that's probably why they think that. We have photographs of that. <laughs> so, um, much of the emphasis on the Trinity has been through the baptismal declaration because to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit has been a declaration for baptism since the earliest times. Uh, Basil the Great, again I mentioned earlier, one of the Cappadocian fathers in the 4th century said, we are bound to be baptized in the terms we have received and to profess faith in the terms by which we have been baptized. In other words, that we're baptized in terms of the basic belief we have and our basic belief is the thing into which we are baptized. You know, he's just telling, telling that in two different directions. But that's how critically important it was seen. That attestation of the Matthew 28 passage, 
The non-Trinitarians will say that several of the Trinity-based, uh, of the Trinity-related passages, like Matthew 28, it comes right at the end of the of the book. They're written in, and they say that means somebody probably added that later. Well, that's kind of convenient to say you think it got added later with no justification other than that it's something you don't like or don't want to agree with. The fact is that there have been no scholars of any significance who have questioned the, um, the reliability of Matthew 28 as part of the original gospel. And in fact, that has been affirmed. The baptismal uh, commissioning, uh, part of the Great Commission in Matthew, has been affirmed in the Didache, which is the first, the early sort of uh, catechism for training Christians. Um, and through the patristic works throughout the whole first and second centuries, Ignatius, Tertullian, Hippolytus, Cyprian, uh, Gregory of Thamaturgus, those were some of the early fathers, again, first and second centuries. They all affirmed that as part of Matthew's gospel and as critical to our understanding of the nature of God. So there isn't any justification for saying that that's not valid other than somebody doesn't like it. Um, I'm going to talk about that at the very end here. We'll talk about the relationships within the Trinity which is one of the difficult parts we have. There's one God in three persons. Each person is God, whole and entire. And yet, it appears as though there is an apparent separation of functions that relates with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For instance, if you read the first uh, 14 verses of the book of Ephesus, that is Ephesus 1, 1 to 14, it talks about the fact that the Father chooses who will be saved. That's verse 4. And then the Son redeems those people. That's verse 7. And then the Holy Spirit seals them in verse 13. We've already talked about the Holy Spirit has very clearly delineated responsibilities. Um, redemption is a responsibility of the Son. And so there's a sense in which each of the persons of the Trinity have different responsibilities. And also, and this is the one that's caused most grief over the years in terms of uh, difficulties with people, that... The Bible does describe the Son and the Holy Spirit, well, the Son as being subordinate to the Father, and the Holy Spirit being subordinate to the Son. Athanasius, the great theologian, talked about the fact that there really is, there are two considerations going on here. One is, for instance, Jesus' temporal and voluntary subordination of the Incarnation, the fact that he set aside his power, versus his eternal divine status. Now, that passage I referred to earlier, Philippians 2, let me read it to you. John, uh, Paul writes in Philippians 2, starting with verse 5, In your relationships, people, with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Some translations say to be grasped or hung on to Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the cross, even uh, e obedient to death, even death on a cross. So it says, in very nature, Jesus was God. But he did not deem that nature, his equality with God, something to be grafted or held onto, but rather set it aside and made himself take on our nature for our sakes, even to the point of death on a cross. So it affirms at the same time that he was fully God, fully of the nature of God, and had all the authority and power of God, and yet set it aside for us. Okay? When we, uh, Athanasius, the Cappadocian Fathers, and others have dealt with, have dealt through history, a lot of theologians have dealt with this, um, the question of whether there is an economic inequality. What that means is, is the Father stronger than the Son? Is the Son more powerful than the Holy Spirit? The doctrine has always been identified that no, there is no economic hierarchy. There is no difference in authority or power, but rather that the persons of the Trinity have chosen to accept certain tasks. Okay, in, And I'll give you an analogy here. In our household, my responsibility is to take care of the cars. Or if we didn't have a gardener, we'd probably be to mow the lawn. Okay. As Garrison Keillor said that the purpose of men in our society is uh, automotive care and lawn maintenance. Um, <laughs> though there are things that are that I have taken on as my responsibility. All right. And in those things, I serve or am subordinate to Carolyn. There are certain things that she's accepted. She does, you know, she does our, our taxes. At least that's, she arranged that somebody else do them. In that, in that regard, 
she used to do them, and then you know we consult on them, and then it got way too complicated when we had you know I was a consultant, she did business on the side, and we had a rental property, and it just got crazy. So, but anyway, there are various aspects of our relationship in which I choose to be subordinate to her. I take on responsibilities and sort of report back to her on. That doesn't mean she's stronger than me, or uh, you know, more powerful than me, or that she's in charge. Nor does it mean the other way around, that I'm more powerful than her, or stronger than her, or whatever. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are subordinate to one another in particular ways because they accept responsibilities as part of their role as one of the three persons of the Trinity. It does not mean any one of the three is less. You understand that? Okay. Um, one question. Yes. In, in, in this regard. How would we look at creation then? That it was God the Father? Or was it the Trinity in total? Or Well, there are aspects of the creation. It appears as though, again, looking at Genesis 1, um, it starts out within the beginning God. The implication is that that's God the Father, because it says, and his spirit is hovering over the waters. And God spoke the word and said, let there be light, and there was light. John 1 then tells us that through the Word, who is Jesus, and that's clear because on verse 14 he says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory, um, that the Word was the one through whom all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made, John says. And so there's the, the intent of God the Father, the activity of God the Word, and the presence of the Holy Spirit all are right there in creation, Genesis 1. Okay? Fair? Question about that? Down through, I mentioned Athanasius several times. In the 4th century, the Athanasian Creed is the one that really hammers down the nature of the Trinity. And I'm going to quote to you from it. We worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance, for there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Spirit. But the Godhead of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal, such as the Father is, such as the Son, and such as the Holy Spirit. Let me give you a couple of analogies for how this works. How can there be three in one? It's one God, it's not three gods, and yet there's three distinct parts of it. There have been analogies since the very first part of this. And we've I've talked about this in some other, other classes. Um, the symbol of Ireland is the shamrock. And the reason the symbol of Ireland is the shamrock is because it's said that St. Patrick used the shamrock, which is one, it's got one stalk, but it's got three very distinct parts, you know, three-leaf clover, um, as a symbol of the fact that in one there is three. And that, that was how he explained the Trinity to the Irish pagans, and, that, and they came to accept it, and to accept, therefore, Christ and Christianity. There have been other analogies that simply don't work. You may have heard people say, well, like water can be either ice, or it can be steam, or it can be liquid. One thing that's in three forms. But that, that's a problem, because it can't be all three at the same time. And our belief is that God the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all three exist at once. That idea of being one or the other, but not all three at the same time, is modalism. That God appears in particular modes. He's either the Father, or He's the Son, or He's the Holy Spirit. That's one of the heresies. That's not what we believe. He is all three at the same time. The best physical analogy that I had ever heard was an egg. That an egg, you have one egg, and yet it's got three distinct parts that can be separated. There's a shell, and there's a white, and there's a yolk. All of them make up one egg, and yet all three are distinctive. And you can, you know, you can use them for different things. Uh, they each have their own purposes. If you're making um, um, meringue, then you only use the white. Okay, if you want protein, in your protein shape, you use the yolk, etc., or whatever. You know, it's, but the idea is you can separate them. None of those still, analogies always break down. I think, and it, after years and years and years, this occurred to me, that the best analogy we have for the Trinity and how the Trinity exists as three in one is us. Um, we are made in the image of God. And it occurred to me finally, several years ago, that one of the ways in which we are made in the image of God is that I have a mind, I have a body, and I have a spirit. And they are distinctive elements within me as one person. The mind is the controlling force. The body is the physical presence, the incarnation, if you will, carne, meat. It's in the flesh. That's where chili con carne comes from. It's in the meat. Um, the flesh 
And then the spirit, the spirit being the part of me that, that perceives and responds to things that are not cognitive. Love and honor and joy and, you know, uh, loyalty, things of that sort are very real. And I respond to those things, but not in a cognitive way, not by the power of my mind. It's even possible for my mind to leave and my body to still continue to, to survive for a while. Right? So there is a sense in which all of these make up one me, and ultimately they all three need to be there for me to be a whole person, and yet there also is a distinction in them. I believe that's exactly how there is God the Father, the controlling mind, if you will, of the Godhead. There is God the, the Son, who is the incarnate, who became the physical representation for us, and there is God the Holy Spirit that responds to the things that are deeper than we are cognitively able to perceive. To me, that's the best analogy I think that I can come up with in terms of the nature of the Trinity. How can there be three in one? Well, look. All right? We're right there. And so we should have a sense in which that not only is possible, but that is a reality in terms of how God is created, uh, is created and has created, that we are made in his image in that regard. Okay? Now, I mentioned to you earlier that the word Godhead does not, I'm talking about terms now, the word Godhead does not have anything to do with the word head. It is an old English sort of variation on Godhood, the personhood, if you will. Um, it, it refers to the Trinity. You could almost say Godhead and Trinity are interchangeable terms because the Godhood or divinity that, that, that word that we could interpret as Godhead actually occurs in Scripture. There are three places. Um, in Acts 17.29, the Greek word theon. In Romans 1.20, the Greek word theotes. And in Colossians 2.9, the Greek word theo, theotes, which are all obviously the same root. They're usually translated divinity or deity or divine nature. But they could easily, if we were more comfortable with the word, be interpreted Godhead, because they are talking about the entire divine nature of God, not any one of the three persons. So that's what the word Godhead means. It denotes the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together as Trinity. Some people make the mistake of, mistake of thinking Godhead means God the Father, as though it's the thinking part or whatever. No, that means all of it. We also talk about personhood. Again, uh, the Christian doctrine defines, a Trinity defines God as three persons or hypostases. Remember, Jesus' two nature is the hypostatic union, divine and human. Hypostases means persons. Those persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As I said earlier, and to me this is helpful, is the nature is what one, uh, a nature is what one is. A person is who what one is. When we talk about the nature of God, it is one, because it is what God is, his one deity. But as a person, who is he? That's manifested in three different persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Again, all of them can say I. All of them can relate to us as I, thou. Now, the nature, uh, being a nature of Christ, obviously, the Christological questions are a huge part of this. And down through the, especially the first 700 years, for seven centuries of the Christian faith, was primarily concerned theologically with dealing with heresies and errors in these, um, this theology of the Christology and of the Trinity. They fought heresies like Ebionism, and if you go back to last week's PowerPoint, I actually give you a, a breakdown of some of these. Ebionism, Docetism, um, Allegism, uh, Sabellianism, Arianism, Apollinarianism, Nestorian, Nestorianism, uh, Eutychism, you should get up here and pronounce these, uh, etc. These are various errors that were made, and the church determined them to be errors based on Scripture, either in the nature of Jesus and his two, uh, the, the nature and person of Jesus as being divine and human, and particularly how that fits into the Trinity as one as the second person of the Trinity. Now, um, I want to talk about some disagreements within Trinitarianism. This is one of the final things. But let me say something about the mystery of the Trinity. I'm just trying to give you some analogies. The Eastern Orthodox theology, that is the Eastern Orthodox churches, they have stated unequivocally that the essence or nature of God is, is by its very existence beyond human comprehension. So if you have trouble understanding this, don't feel too bad. It is an official doctrine of the Eastern Orthodox Church that human beings cannot comprehend this that these issues cannot be defined in a way that the human understanding can really approach them. This is, that's why it's considered a mystery. 
Roman Catholic teaching is somewhat similar in that regard, that the Trinity as a concept is really beyond human reason. Um, strictly speaking, the Trinity of God has always been identified as one of the great mysteries of the church. They can neither be known by unaided human reason, I'm quoting here, nor cognitively demonstrated by reason after it has been revealed. It is not contrary to our reason, but it is not able to be completely conceived of in rational terms. This is the nature of, there, there are quite a few different truths in, in our experience of life that that's true for. It is not contradictory, meaning they're not, you know, they're not inherently impossible against one another, the idea of the Trinity being three persons of God in one deity. Uh, but it is a paradox. It is a mystery. It's difficult for us to conceive of it rationally or to articulate it with our language. Despite all, I've talked about this in all the 2,000 years of conversation about the Trinity, it still sort of defies explanation. Augustine in the 5th century stated that any explanation of the Trinity is beyond the ability of human language and that the definition of the Trinity as three persons is, is but a similitude, meaning as close as we can get, in order to try to express it. And that the true understanding of it will not be known to us until we are in the presence of God. Okay, so let's just recognize that. Um, Hilary of Poitiers, uh, Poitiers, French word, I don't speak French, Poitiers, the city, stressed that as God is infinite, eternal, and omnipresent, then his true nature is unfathomable, and words cannot describe him. Hillary notes that Scripture states that no one knows God except the Son, Jesus said that, and as to how the Son could be begotten and yet not be created, he's not a created being, and yet he is begotten of the Father, John 3.16. Um, Hillary, uh, the, one of the church fathers and others, admit this is a mystery and we confess our ignorance at understanding it for the Son did not reveal exactly how that all worked. Someday he will. Um, so it is a mystery. Don't feel too bad if you don't fully understand it. Yes? Um, how is the word begotten translated in the New Testament? Um, <clears throat> how is it in the NIV? Begotten is the way I usually... Heard it. In fact, I think I remember the NIV. I'm not. I'm not happy with it. Um, with what they say. His. I think they usually just say his only son. But that's a problem because because it says to him he gave he gave power to them he gave power to become the sons of God even to those who believe on his name. And so that that causes a problem for us too. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Okay. Again. Uh, 1 John says, to as many as believed on his name, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. It's not sons by decision of the Father or by natural means, but rather sons, sons by God. Uh, and so, um, yeah, we don't have begotten. It's begotten in the same way that a son is begotten of, somewhat the same way, as a son is begotten of an earthly father. It means that you're like him. You're of the same substance. You know, you, you're made of the same stuff. But the difference is that Jesus, as the begotten Son, is co-eternal. He has always been there. There was, there was not, see, this was Arius' heresy. Arius and Arianism that led to the Ninth Council of Nicaea. He said there was a time when he, Jesus, was not. Meaning he was a created being. That is not our belief. And no? the creed says begotten, not made. Begotten, not made. Not exactly. Made. So, <laughs> somehow, Jesus the Son is begotten of the Father. He, he, he is descended from the Father, and yet he's co-eternal with the Father. Proceeds from the Father. That's another one that's... Proceeds created. from the Father and the Son. Okay. Proceeds. That's right. Um, so, it is a mystery. Let's just recognize that. We do the best we can with it. And I think there are some analogies that help us a little bit. But when he makes us sons, that's by putting his Holy Spirit into us. Mm -hmm. uh, that's correct. Yeah. So we are become sons of God. Like sons. Right. But not sons in the same way that Jesus no, is a no, son. That's still, the talent. still sons because we have, we have God in us. <laughs> that's why I struggle with one and only son yeah. kind of thing. Because of that... The definition of son changes there. Okay, let me talk about some disagreements within Trinitarianism and some of the heresies. Um, there are differences between the Roman Catholic theology that teaches that God the Father is the eternal source of the Son, what we're just talking about. And this is an example of the fact that this is difficult. Um, that there is an eternal procession from the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. And that the Father breathes the Holy Spirit with and through the Son. 
Eastern Orthodox churches do not hold to the presence of the Holy Spirit as being proceeding from the Son, but rather only that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Now let me say, when I say Roman Catholicism, their doctrine obviously on this was defined before Protestantism existed in the 1500s. But the Protestant beliefs, whatever other differences we may have, our Trinitarian beliefs in the Protestant faith is um, based on Roman Catholicism. We don't have a, a real problem with that. We're pretty consistent with them in terms of our belief about the Trinity. So when we talk about Catholic or Protestant beliefs in the Trinity, they're very much the same. Now, so I'll say Western Trinitarianism, Catholic, Protestant, Western beliefs, they affirm that the Son is begotten or sometimes generated from the Father in the way that a, son, a human son is generated from a father, a human father, that the Son is begotten or generated from the Father and that the Spirit proceeds from the Father, but the Father is neither begotten nor does he proceed from anywhere else. This is where you get into that relationship between the three that's difficult for us to understand. There has been a long-standing argument over whether the Spirit proceeds from the Father alone or whether the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And you say, well, what does that matter? Well, it mattered enough that in the, the 11th century, that caused the split between Roman Catholic, that particular point caused the final split between the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Churches of the East the Latin Roman Church and the Greek Orthodox Churches. It was over the fact that the Catholic Church had added to, or kind of resurrected is probably a better way, what's called the filioque, when we say the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And the Son is filioque in Latin, and this came from the Western Church in Latin. Filioque, from the Son. The Eastern Church said, wait a minute, we don't agree. We don't think the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son. We think He proceeds from the Father only. And that caused a split in the church. A huge split in the church. The biggest split in the church ever. In terms of the number of people affected and everything else, it was much bigger than the Protestant Reformation at the time. Okay, uh, The Great Schism came from that. And the Western Church, that is the Latin Church, had decided in 589 to add and the Son. But nobody enforced it. They didn't actually put it in. Okay, there was a council of Toledo in 589, Toledo in Spain, not Toledo in Ohio. And they decided to, that, and the Son, that the Spirit, theologically, they believe the Spirit proceeded from the Son as well as the Father. But nobody actually put that in. And in fact, the popes made a point of not putting it in. One of the popes, Pope Leo III, said that no, it shouldn't be in there. But then, in the papal mass in the 11th century, 1014, Pope Benedict VIII did put it in and said all of the Catholic Church had to use it. And that was what caused the Eastern Church to split off. And they went their own way over filioque and the Son. How does the Holy Spirit proceed? Is it just from the Father or is it from the Father and the Son? Now most Protestant groups, the reason we can quote that is because most all Protestant groups do include that filioque clause in our declaration of the Nicene Creed. But we don't even think about it. Protestants have not made that a huge issue. That's why I say our doctrine of the Trinit our Trinitarian beliefs come out of the Catholic Church, and it was resolved uh, a long time before Protestant Reformation occurred. So we had just accepted that. But in fact, the filioque has been affirmed in the Westminster Confession, which is the confession of Presbyterian Reformed churches, as well as in the London Baptist Confession and the Lutheran Augsburg Confession. So a number of major Protestant bodies have gone back and from the theology behind it, even though most of us don't ever even think about it. Um, so, just so you know, three little words, and the sun split the church in the 11th century. Um, huge thing. Now, there are some who are non-Trinitarian. Now, those were, I was just referring to something where there's a difference in interpretation of the Trinity between Orthodoxy and Catholicism and Protestantism on the two sides. But within the Christian traditions even, there are some Christian bodies who have rejected the doctrine of the Trinity and are willing to call themselves non-Trinitarian. Um, there are some who, who focus on binitarianism, which means two deities, or two persons within the deity. Um, either one, it could be either one of those two. And generally what they would say is that the Holy Spirit is not a person. You know, he's just a, a sort of force. There is Unitarianism, Unitarian Universalists, we have a church in town. They deny the divinity of Jesus, generally speaking, and say that there is only one deity. 
This is similar or analogous to the Jewish interpretation of the Shema that we talked about or the Muslim belief in the Ta'i, uh, as I said earlier, the belief that Allah is one and that's so foundational. But there's also uh, Christians today who still maintain modalism, that God is one but he has manifested himself in either the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit. Like somebody said, God the Father played the first half of the football game and he spent Jesus in to play the third quarter and then in the fourth quarter the Holy Spirit came and kicked a few field goals to win the game. Um, that's not what we believe, <laughs> okay? which is why I use that silly analogy, because that's not, that's not what we believe about God. There's also some who, and this is a very liberal, modern idea, who advocate what they call social Trinitarianism, and that is that um, God is one, but that he expresses his love and accord with humanity and with various aspects of himself in such a way that there's not really three persons in the Trinity, but it looks like it because God's all love and everything, and it comes across that way. And then there's actually a, a branch of the Pentecostal Church called Oneness Pentecostalism that advocates that there is only one, you know, uh, there's only one God, and that there's sort of a modalistic kind of approach. All of those different non-Trinitarian groups have different kinds of ideas. Some of them count themselves as being part of Protestantism, and some of them don't. In any sort of literal definition of Protestantism, they would not be included, because as I said earlier, the doctrine of the Trinity is considered the foundational doctrine because it incorporates inside it the Christological doctrines. The doctrine of the Trinity is foundational to our belief as Christians, and especially so as Protestants or as Catholics. But those non-Trinitarian ideas actually go back to some of the ancient heresies. They go back to Arianism or Ebionitism or Gnosticism, and those things have been carried down through all of that time. And various of those views that are even today held, non-Trinitarian views, have been exactly the things that have been refuted and rejected by Irenaeus and Athanasius and in various of the ecumenical councils in the first seven centuries, and yet still those heresies continue. Most particularly the Nicene Creed was the one that established the doctrine of the Trinity, and as I've said, that the, the, uh, the, doc, the Council of Chalcedon later uh, really kind of nailed it down. You then have pseudo-Christian groups, and I'm not trying to be unkind, but there's no better way to describe it, like the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses uh, believe only that God the Father is the true and almighty God, and he has a son, but the son is very much subordinate in, in terms of power as well as everything else. Um, the Jehovah's Witnesses acknowledge that Jesus was pre-existent and a unique son in some way, they believe that he had a role in creation and redemption, but that only the Father was without beginning. In effect, that's Arianism. Okay, that's what Arius said in the, the end of the 3rd, start of the 4th century, which led to, to Nicaea. Uh, in Mormonism, as I said, the most prominent conception is that God is a Godhead, which they see as a divine council of three distinct beings, which they call Elohim, their name for the Father, Jehovah, which is what they call the Son, um, even though there's no such word as Jehovah, and the Holy Spirit. And they believe that the Father and the Son are considered to have practical, or I'm sorry, perfected material bodies, while the Holy Spirit has a spirit body. The Mormons recognize the divinity of the Father, of the Son, and Holy Spirit as distinct beings, but they are not united in substance, but only in purpose and will. In other words, they are different creatures. There's a separation between them. And yet they believe they're all, each one omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent. So their understanding of the nature and person of God the Trinity, as well as of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, is quite different than ours. And you get similar kinds of things in Christian scientists, etc. So there's very different understandings. And by the way, my comment there that there's no such word as Jehovah, you know where Jehovah comes from? You understand that? Yeah. Well, Jehovah, in the, the, Jewish, the Jewish faith, in order to make sure that they were obeying the commandments to not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, whenever they came to the proper name of God, Yahweh, in the Bible, they would not pronounce it when they were reading out loud. And so, particularly when they were teaching young, young men, 13-year-old boys, to uh, take their part in the, in the body of the Jewish faith, they would teach them to read from the scrolls. As they were teaching them, they would there are no, there are no vowels in, in ancient written languages. There are no vowels written in Hebrew or any of the ancient languages, because vowels are for pronunciation. They're breathing sounds. A, E, A, U, you know, kind of thing. You don't need them when you write. And so when, when young men, Jewish men, were reading along in the scripture, and they would get the Yahweh, they were instructed, instead of saying Yahweh,
they were supposed to, to pronounce um, the generic name for God. Okay? Um, and so the vowel points would be put over on the side so they could learn from the generic name for God, which was Adonai. And so they would be reading along, they would come to Yahweh, and they would instead pronounce Adonai, and they have the vowel points over here to remind them of that. Later on, somebody who didn't know what they were doing took the consonants from Yahweh and the vowel points from Adonai and put them together and came up with Jehovah. There is no such real word. It's a merging of two different words in Hebrew, okay? Just for your interest. doesn't mean there's anything necessarily wrong with it. It's as accurate as any other word we might want to choose to use for God, but just important that we know these things, I think. Okay. Um, I'm not going to get into some of the particulars in terms of the historic uh, heresies at this point. What I'm going to end, because we've talked about some of those before, are the idea of Arianism, Adoptionism, Sabellianism, and there's information in last week's um, discussion. The last thing I want to finish with is this statement, which um, to me is critical. We don't have a full, full rational conception nor an ability to articulate fully the doctrine of the Trinity, and yet you've just heard two hours worth of evidence for why we believe this is what's in Scripture and why this is our doctrine, and yet many people still choose to reject it. Uh, this is a quote from some material that I, I used. The difference between those who believe in the Trinity and those who do not is not an issue of understanding the mystery. The difference is primarily one of belief concerning the personal identity of Christ. It is a difference in conception of the salvation connected with Christ that drives all reactions, either favorable or unfavorable, to the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. As it is, the doctrine of the Trinity is directly tied up with what a person believes about Christ the nature of Christ and how that fits in with the nature of God the Father and, and of uh, the Holy Spirit. So last week's Christology, I said, was the basic issue of what it meant to be a Christian, but the Trinity has embedded in it all of those same questions about the nature of Jesus, but increases to also take into that an understanding of how, how God the Father and God the Holy Spirit are related to Jesus in the, in the triune God, the Trinity. Questions about any of that? Are you blown away? Are you dead? <laughs> I warned you. <laughs> um, some of these are hard things. That's why we say it's a mystery. We admit it's a mystery. It's part of the official doctrine of the church that it's a mystery. And yet it's important because I venture to say that there's no one Christian doctrine that has gotten wrong more often than the nature of the Trinity. I mean, I gave you some examples of. Uh, the misunderstanding or, or misinterpreting the nature of Jesus and affecting the nature of the Trinity because of that. And so it's more important that we have clarity on the Trinity as a core doctrine of the Christian faith. And inside that, a clear understanding of the nature of person of Jesus, our Christological understanding, than anything else when we start talking about doing Christian theology. All right? Questions or comments? Expressions of travail? Dream? <laughs> that was good. Thank you, folks. You get 10 extra minutes in your day. Yes.